What I want to do now is walk you through the content. And you might be thinking, ooh, this cap thing sounds like a lot of technology. Not really. The technology is pretty simplistic. The key thing about CAP is the content. So let's walk through with barely any technology and just talk about what is the content of a CAP message. Remember this screen, right, this diagram. CAP is a standard form for certain information about just about any kind of hazard, threat, or event. The key requirement of any CAP-enabled alerting is that alerting authorities are putting out messages in CAP format. There's the learning objectives, but we're going to go to the topics. And my first topic is, how do you put a CAP alert on a public internet host? And we're going to do that simply by editing a text file. And we'll take it piece by piece. Here's my setup. My example is we're going to do an alerting situation that is a power failure. Now we have a collection of templates for various kinds of outages or various kinds of events, if you will, hazards. And this is what those look like. These are in Spanish. We have them in, in Dutch for Suriname <laughs> and uh, Papimento in uh, English and uh, Germ um, no, Dutch, French. At any rate, these are the various um, alerts as templates to help you pick up the headline, description, and instruction without having to be too creative. So here we have a headline from that template that says, electrical power failure at, then we'll fill in the location. The description will be a location is experiencing power failure. All buildings and facilities are affected. And the instruction, you could read for yourself. So we need the area. So the area description in my chosen example is Geneva, airport to lake and river. This may not mean anything to you if you've not been to Geneva, but that's a pretty nice bounding area. The airport is basically the size of the city up on the north boundary. And if you drop a line, a line down to the lake and down to the river, it's that whole northern sector. So we just use that for our CAP area description, stick it into the area desk and the description, and you're done. You've got the area desk, the headline, and the instruction right out of the template. We want to fill in the category. We have 11 to choose from. You can select multiple. So for example, if you're doing a landslide, a landslide is geophysical, but it's also meteorological, because the land doesn't slide absent rain, generally speaking. Um, it, it will slide in a, a volcano, obviously, and <laughs> uh, earthquake. But generally speaking, uh, landslides are both geophysical and uh, meteorological. Uh, for the event, we simply put the words power failure. Okay. That's just a, a text description. Urgency. I talked about this uh, briefly before. Urgency, severity, and certainty. The three aspects of the hazard situation that we need to rank how much we really need your attention. Okay, It's the attention dimension has three aspects. First, for urgency, we can choose between immediate which means responsive action has to be taken right now. Expected, that's within the next hour. Future, beyond an hour, but in the near future. And past means you no, no longer do that. Now, understand, when we talk about the urgency, we mean from the time we want you to start taking action. If you've got a hurricane coming ashore, in, in the, um, the Florida Keys, for example. It takes days, two or three days, to evacuate the Keys. So two or three days before the hurricane arrives, we start telling you to act. So the urgency is act now or within the next hour, even though the event might be several days away. Okay. 
CAP is all about acting. What do people need to do? It is not describing the event. It's describing what people do because of the impacts of the event. Okay, so you could say CAP is inherently oriented toward impact-based forecasting. And specifically here, we're talking the urgency, the severity. We have extreme, severe, then moderate or minor. Okay, so extreme is defined as extraordinary threat. Severe is significant threat. Moderate is possible threat, and minor is minimal to no known threat. In this particular case of a power outage, what do we choose for urgency? Well, the power outage has already started. It has failed. So it's immediate. Severity, it's conceivable people could die in a power failure, but that's not usual. It's, it's really minor, OK? Minor severity. Then the last one is at what certainty? Now, certainty in CAP just has four levels. It's not a numeric number. <laughs> it's greater than 50% or less than 50%. The top two is observed. And that means we're just about positive that this is real, OK? If, you, if you're a social scientist, this is a P95, you know, or P, P less than 0.05, that kind of thing. Then likely is a 50%. And uh, the next one, which is possible, is less than 50%. And the unlikely is really not at all likely, OK? So less than um, uh, five or, or in terms of the uh, social science. So in this case, we are selecting observed, because we know it has happened already, all right? Let me also point out. This is a policy thing, so this isn't in the standard, but let me point out. The top two levels in all of these has a special indication for many countries. That's when you do sirens. That's when you go to every cell phone in the alerting area. Okay, it's rare. Less than one in a 1,000 of your CAP alerts have top urgency, severity, and certainty. That means I need you to act within the next hour. People will be killed. That's what these, these are life critical, the top two levels. And we're at least 50% certain. OK, if all of those are true, it's what we sometimes, in China, for example, they call it a red alert. In the United States, it's called the, um, Wireless emergency alerts, it's actually in law. This, these top two levels are codified in the regulations that flow from the law. So rule of thumb, that's what you want to do. Gauge your things so that when you do a red alert, it's because all of those two, all of those settings are in the top two levels. Think about that when you're doing your IBF matrix or whatever, because that same thing should be in your thinking. Status, these next three are, are probably always set the same way for your case. Status, it's actual. Because it's not an exercise, it's not just a system reporting thing, and it's not a test. You, you may have heard about the nuclear attack on Hawaii. Should have been listed as a test. <laughs> it wasn't. Yeah, that's just common that you, you get the test thing wrong. There was a, there was a National Weather Service alert that was put out that should have said test, and it said the Earth has left its orbit and is hurtling toward the sun, which would have been pretty severe, but it should have been listed as a test. Um, in this case, for message type, we're selecting alert. This is the original reporting of this particular event. It's not an update or a cancel. And don't worry about ACK and error. That's Nobody's using that as far as I know. It's, it's from the days before we fixed CAP to understand it's not a protocol. It's a format. But at any rate, what's the difference between update and cancel with respect to finishing off an alert? If what you mean is to tell people it's all clear, 
the storm has passed or the flood has receded or we thought it was going to be a flood, but it wasn't. That's an update that says all clear. Cancel means, oops, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have given you that at all. In the case of earthquakes, we do a lot of cancels because we can't predict them. <laughs> and we really need to warn people. So we go ahead and issue it when we think it's an earthquake. And then we have to say, no, 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 that wasn't really what, it wasn't at all what we thought it was going to be. So. Uh, but cancel is, is very distinct, so don't think that you can just cancel to say, oh, the thing's finished now. No, that's an update. Scope. En cuanto al alcance, en este caso en particular. The um, scope is public because it's not restricted to a particular audience, nor is it private to an individual. Okay, the next thing we have is the identifier. We have to have a globally unique identifier for your alert. Uh, there's no choice on that. It has to be globally unique. How you make that globally unique is your own choice. I recommend that you use the OID, which ties you back to the Register of Alerting Authorities, right down to this level. So I've said 756 is uh, Switzerland, and I uh, am imagining that 756.1 is the Swiss Utilities Company. They are not actually registered at the moment, but they could be. And then within that, they made something unique. Who can guess what they did to make theirs unique? Uh, is that month, day, year? Yeah. <laughs> month, day, year, hour, minute, second. So if they issue more than one per second, they just add another number onto that. In the case of um, US National Weather Service, they do, in fact, issue multiple per second. But you can just make that, whatever you do to make it unique, we don't, the rest of the world doesn't care. But we want the first part of it to be able to tie you back to the Register of Alerting Authorities so we know where that alert came from, who's responsible for that. All right, the next is the sender. The sender, we want to have. Uh, typically an email address. Uh, it could be a web page. But it needs to be some place that's got a staff who will respond when people say, uh, so I've got your alert. I want to do a story on it on the news tonight. And I need something for my B-roll. What do you got? <laughs> or I don't really understand what you're saying about this. What should I? Somebody they can talk to. Typically a help desk. Uh, sometimes the public relations office. But something staffed. Don't just put them off to some static thing where they'll you know, go find it yourself how to uh, pursue this. Try to help them. The sender should be somebody who will provide help to, for the receivers to further understand this, particularly if it's a, a disseminator like a journalist or, or something. Uh, for the sent, it's simply the date and time issued. And that's always in UTC. We used to uh, call Greenwich Mean Time. Um, in this particular case, Greenwich Mean Time is two hours earlier than Geneva, so that's why it has the plus two on there. So when you put that all together, and again, you could do this with a text, for, a text editor, just you know, copy this template and then put your own stuff in the values, that's your cap alert. You're done. So if you can answer those questions, which is pretty straightforward description, instruction, then choose from these little pull down lists, if you will. You're done. You save that with an extension of .xml, and you've got a cap alert. How do you put your cap alert onto an internet host? Well, it's a file, so you make a link to it. Go to your home page for your agency. Make a pointer to the file you just created, and the link has the description in it which in this case says electrical power failure Geneva, airport to Lake and River. OK, and that means when a user goes there, here's what they see. And you're like, yeah, I don't want my users seeing that. That's XML. Right, so you use this little style sheet right here, which takes that XML and makes it pretty. Puts your header on there. Here it's your Yes. 
because it's the header I happen to have at the time I was doing it. You have a footer, you know, you make it pretty, and that's nice indented, but it's XML underneath so that the machines still process it. Okay? So, you might think you're done, and in a sense you are, but let me add a caution. You need to make sure that it's valid. The downside of doing something that's processable by machines, as well as being readable by humans, is the machines are very fussy people. They're not good at dealing with things that are ambiguous. They want it well-defined. So what's well-defined? It means it complies with the CAP schema. There are two versions of that, 1.1, 1.2. Um, 1.2 is already eight years old. Don't worry about 1.1. It's basically past history. Yours will all be 1.2. You have to um, validate it, but that is something that's automatically handled when you use a tool. If you're doing it by hand, I'll show you where you go to, to do the validation by hand. Um, which version is actually right in the alert itself? The very last piece there. This happens to be cap 1.1. <coughs> We also have a, another wrinkle, if you will, that you can profile cap. A profile means that you want to go beyond just saying it's valid and say, but it's, it's also compliant with some special restrictions that we have here in our country. For example, Canada by law has to have French and English in the document. It actually is not a good idea to do that, but they're required by law, so they have to. Um, so in their profile, it says, we don't consider it compliant with Canadian intent if the French and English aren't in the same alert. Okay, so that's a profile. As you, as a, a receiver of alerts, can then say, well, since they forgot to do the French, I'm not going to process the alert. I don't think most people will do that. I think most people will say, it's perfectly valid cap. I'm going to warn those people because I don't want them dying just because the Canadian office forgot to put in the French. Okay, but that's your choice. Uh, profiles are out there. I do not recommend them for exactly that problem of you, you leave it to the disseminator to make a really difficult choice about what they should do with a non-compliant alert. Now, inside of Canada, it's perfectly lo logical that somebody in Canada is monitoring all of the Canadian feeds, and when they see something that's valid cap but not Canadian profile, they'll write a letter and get that agency to clean up its act, say, hey, you know, by Canadian law, you have to have the French, and you're not doing it, Ontario, <laughs> so go fix it. All right, that's kind of other than real-time processing. In real-time processing, basically valid alerts, go out and get processed. Um, profile, it's a little bit questionable. So how do you actually do that? Again, because the cap is in XML, you use an XML validator. This technology has been around for at least a dozen years. Oh, no, longer than that. But at any rate, XML um, is in every computing language. It's in the browser. So it's easy to do. Um, if you want to do it by hand, because we just made the alert by hand, you can go to this online resource, the Google CAP Validator. You can just Google that and find it. Um, it's alert-hub right there. Oh, it's capvalidator.appspot.com, excuse me, is its URL. And then you can just drop your code that you just created by hand, drop it in this box. If you then hit the validate key, It'll come back and say, valid, yay. Now you're happy. So you know that that's good to, and if you had an error, like you left off one of the angle brackets, it'll say, mm -mm, error, and it'll tell you what, the, what has to be fixed. So that's what you do. Let me switch gears again and talk about something that is not specific to CAT. This is everything that you do with alerting. 
whether it's old traditional alerting on radio and TV and email and faxes, or it's modern day alerting with CAP and automated digital signage, whenever. Security, authorization, and reliability. We know that not all alerting systems are life critical or politically sensitive, but certainly there are cases, and probably for every one of you, the alerting system could be targeted by attempts to disrupt service or to falsify information. And all internet hosts are targeted by malware that's probing you randomly. It just happens. You bring up a new server, and within minutes, you've had hundreds of attacks. That's the nature of the internet. We also have a situation where your server can be overwhelmed without harmful intent. Okay? You can have, for example, Tonga issues a tsunami alert. Reuters picks it up. CNN picks it up. People all over the world are going to the little server in Tonga. Ooh, what's happening here? I'm sorry. You're going to crash their server. It's not your intent to crash it, but it looks like a distributed denial of service attack just because you're suddenly very popular. So you can be overwhelmed. And whether you're overwhelmed with harmful intent or you're overwhelmed without harmful intent, you have to have policy, procedures align with that policy, technology to implement the procedures align with that policy to assure that you have appropriate reliability and security of all systems that support your alerting functions. And again, not just CAP, yes CAP, but not just CAP. That's true for radio and TV and cell phone, SMS, mess, your, your Facebook, whatever you're doing with alerting, you got to have the security stuff covered. Also, let's look at the specific situation where you have certain positions require special access, such as the authority to create or the authority to issue alerts. By your position, say you are the chief forecaster or you're the head of the Met Service, you have authorities and we need the technology, the procedures and technology to implement that and we're going to talk about that. Now, there's a lot of different mechanisms to implement security. Uh, it's pretty likely that your internet hosting service will have a particular preference, uh, probably even mandate, that you have to do it their way. A common um, facility out there is um, Open Directory. I'm sorry, it's not Open, it's Active Directory. Active Directory, again, predated the internet, but it's very commonly used. Um, and here, what we're going to see this afternoon, and what the software I'm giving you, is for a web container called Apache Tomcat. And what they do is they establish a role, and then they put people into the role. So we're going to have the role for people who can compose a cap alert, and then a smaller group of people who can not only compose it, but they can approve the cap alert. So maybe every forecaster has the ability to compose the alert, but only the meteorologist in charge or the chief or the head of the agency or whatever has the ability to prove it. Okay? This is generally called role-based security. You could implement security with actual individual usernames. That drives you nuts because people change positions all the time. So roles, because the role is really where the authority lies. The role-based security is by far the more common. So that's, that's saying who's authorized. Then how do you authenticate a person saying that they are in that role? OK, so now we've switched between we established that there's an authority, a, a, 
a set of permissions attached to what your role is. And then we say, and here's a person who claims to be the chief meteorologist or the meteorologist in charge or I'm the, the head of the agency. How do you know that? Now we're talking about authentication. How do you authenticate somebody is really who they say they are? Okay, authentication has only three ways to authenticate you. It's something about you, like your iris pattern or your fingerprint. It's something you have, like your card key or your physical key. Or it's something you know, like your password. Of those, by far the most common is password authentication. Sure, there's problems with it. Your passwords are easy to guess. <laughs> but password authentication is what we're going to implement uh, here this afternoon. And here you see that the user is saying, if you want to be in the role of approver cap, I will challenge you to give the password that we know to be reserved for people who are approver cap role. OK. And although I'm giving this in a cap context, again, this is straight stuff for all alerting. You have authentication, authorization, and all of that. I want to spend just a little while cluing you again into something that's a little beyond just your straight cap, but you should, you should have it in mind um, as you're creating alerts. And that is the last mile. If you think of, uh, of the dissemination from the time you create it until it shows up on somebody's phone or on somebody's TV or their siren goes off, it's a whole chain of things that are processing that and kind of boiling it down into what's the actual thing that needs to happen to get people alerted. Each of those potentially adds constraints that you need to be aware of upstream because it's going to affect what goes downstream. One thing that is kind of fundamental is what kind of technology is that thing at the end? Particularly, is it interactive? So if I send you an email, that's an interactive technology. In the email, I give you a link. You can choose to click on the link. If I put it out to the television screen, they can't poke the screen and get anything else to happen, right? So television, faxes, radio are non-interactive. Email, websites, Facebook, they're all interactive. And why does that matter? Because upstream, let's say, for example, we want to put out an alert that is a missing child. And we want to put out the picture of the child. If I'm going to non-interactive media, like television, I have to embed the picture in the actual alert. If I'm going to interactive media, OK, and that's also true of a digital billboard, right? If I'm going to an interactive media, I can just send the link to the picture. Then the user who gets it can choose to say, I'd like to see the picture of that kid. And then they download it at that time. OK? So that's the kind of constraint that we're talking about with interactive, non-interactive. Audio, if you're sending your alert out and it needs to go, for example, over radio, well, you can just send the text, but then you're hoping that the text-to-speech is pretty good. Many times, that's a good assumption. In, the, in the, the dominant languages right now in the world, certainly the European languages, that's actually working really well, but not always. So you might choose to embed the audio, or what we call dereference the URL. In other words, go to the URL and fetch the audio file and actually stick it in a cap alert. You can stick a picture or an audio in the cap alert itself. Or you could send a link. The choice is whether you want all your messages to be that big. Because an audio file 
can be megabytes in size, two or three megabytes to get a decent sounding audio compared to, you know, less than 100 characters to just provide the link. Okay, so you make the choice at somewhere in this chain about when are you going to actually send the audio or when are you just going to send a link to it. In the case of television, um, it's very common, as we talked right at the beginning, to display the emergency alert as crawl text. How much text? 1,800 characters. End of story. That's the constraint by the hardware that does that crawl text insertion. If you're going out in both English and Spanish, because it's a multilingual television station, reserve enough of that 1,800 so that both the English and the Spanish can fit. If you send 1,801 characters, it just overlays your first character with the 1,800. It's, it's really old technology. It's not smart at all. It'll just put out 1,800 characters in round robin. So I talked already about alerting equipment and software should be able to generate a quality audio message by picking out relevant text in the cap alert. In the case of the US and other countries, I've seen this done. The actual crawl text, the actual message that goes to cell broadcast is done by picking things out. So you pick the event type, like tornado. You pick the area description, like Sacramento, California. And you pick the time. And you just push those together, boing, it goes out. OK, that's typically a little algorithm. You know, take this from here, take this from here, concatenate them, you're done. OK, so that's what the cell phone companies want. And we give them that, and they're happy to go out that way. We can also do this text-to-speech processing. Um, here, let me caution you, if you are uh, trying to handle um, first, first peoples or, or native, whatever you call it, in your country, like um, in, in the north of Canada, they call it the First Nations people. They not only don't have good text-to-speech, they don't have good libraries to even show their language in text. So be aware. Sometimes you're going to have to have a native speaker make the audio <laughs> because you can't represent it otherwise and get it out. We're actually in, in Hong Kong at our next workshop having a presentation from somebody who's doing exactly that. He does automatic cap alert audio insertion for First Nations, for which there are, in some cases, less than 100 speakers. <laughs> but you can do that. It's just you've got to plan for it. Probably the easiest way uh, to send alerts out is by email. Simply put it as an attachment to an email, pew, out it goes. In this case, this is one of the first things I did back in 2005 with USGS. There's the geomagnetic storm cap alert as the attachment. And I just pulled out some pieces of the cap alert and stuck them in a nice uh, readable format in the body. The, the nice thing about email is it'll keep retrying. OK, we, we, we need to, to focus a lot on technologies that are tolerant of faulty telecommunication. <laughs> In emergencies, telecom will get faulty. Things will not work like they normally do. So we, we're trying to be tolerant of that to the extent we can. Email is very good for that because it keeps retrying. We also, of course, go short message service. And here my point is. You can make URLs. I don't know if, I've, if you've worked with WMO, but on their website, those URLs go on and on and on. You're putting out short message text. You've used up the whole message with just the URL. You can't even say what the thing is. So you want a nice short URL. There's a thing called tiny URL that does that, for example. But you, you want to make sure that you make it short, because characters matter in short message. This is a, a peculiar example here, but we go from a digital format of a cap text. We make a fax, 
because some people still insist on getting a fax. What are they going to do with the fax? They're going to put it in an OCR so they can turn it back into digital. You might think, oh, that makes no sense. But the real world just doesn't make sense sometimes. That's OK. It's digital. We can make it work. I already talked about in the case of news feeds, um, your browser will pick that up. And here I just illustrate that by showing a news feed of, this is the um, National Weather Service alerts, how it looks when you use the Internet Explorer browser. It looks slightly different when you use Firefox. So the, they, they have a button for subscribing instead of a link. But it's the same thing. Um, in Chrome, you have an add-on to do that. OK, so that's it about dissemination beyond just the, um, the web. These are your questions for those who do home study. <coughs> and here's the uh, reference links. OK, any quick questions about this? Just the content. How to create a cap alert, really not using fancy technology, just text editor, just make the alert, stick the stuff in, put a link to it, and you've got a cap alerting mechanism. OK? Now what I want to do 